Um, so today I'm going to talk about a few things, um, really four things, but three important things. There, the first one is building a great team, practicing failure, which was a huge, huge thing that we did on the campaign, and then facilitating communities, and these are online, offline communities. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about, which is my very favorite thing, is myself. <laughs> um, so, uh, how many of you guys know who these guys are? I mean, this, come on, you raise your hands. I want to see who, who knows. Okay, everyone should have your hands up. This seems like a crowd that should know who these guys are. So, um, who doesn't know who these guys are? Okay, so everyone whose hands. I have a laser pointer. Um, anyway, this is uh, obviously Steve Jobs, John Scully, and Steve Wozniak. And, um, you know, these guys are really important people for my life because this is the first computer that I, uh, that I, that I used. And uh, this is the first computer that I got, I was about six. Um, I loved it, obviously, not actually this computer, but you know, one that was very similar to it. Anyone here read this book? Okay, more hands should go up, because this is a really good book about the history of computing, the history of hackers. Um, Stephen Levy is a, is a great author talking about kind of what has built, what the foundations have built our community, and what we are, you know, the, the, the foundations that we stand on every day. But some of the stuff they talk about in this is this idea of hacking, hackers, um, you know, and, and some of the, the, the concepts of hacking and the important things that I think a lot of us use if we're, if we're interested in open source software, etc., are these things, sharing, openness, collaboration, engaging on the hands-on imperative. And there's a couple things I noticed about this. Um, these are all things that I lived by. Um, and I realized after a while that, for the most part, I'm a hacker. Um, and this kind of came very suddenly, and in, the, and in this community, I don't know about this community, but in my community, you know, hacker is very synonymous with coder. Um, and, and in you know, this world, we share this language a lot, and open source is really important for us. Um, so I wanted to start with that to just give a little bit of an idea of where I came from. So fast forward from when I was six, obviously, um, a bunch of years, and I joined this company, Threadless. Has anyone here heard of Threadless? Hands up again, okay, good, good. Uh, anyone here have a Threadless shirt? Okay, the same people who've heard of it. That's good. <laughs> That's a pretty good you know, brand uh, awareness ratio, right? So the thing about Threadless that's interesting is um, Threadless started in 2000, and around 2004, 2005, the founders were at this conference at uh, MIT, and uh, MIT was like, oh, and welcome to Threadless. They invented crowdsourcing, and the Threadless guys were like, crowd what? We had no idea what crowdsourcing was. All we knew is that we just wanted to very simply um, take crowdsourcing, something like this, we want to take this, um, and we wanted to make it into that. This is a pretty simple thing, you know, you just take a simple illustration and make it into a simple product. That's all we wanted to do. We just happened to do it in a very simple way that had very four steps. The first one was we used the crowd, which would be you guys, to design the t-shirts or upload the designs. Um, they would be uploaded and submitted to our website. Then all of these great people you guys, again, would vote on it, and then cash money would fall from the ceiling. Um, <laughs> and this worked out pretty well, and so really how it worked was, we had these great designers all over the world that uploaded designs, um, then the community voted on them, and they really facilitated kind of this really great um, trend watching. So we were always ahead of the trend in regards to apparel, um, in like fascinating t-shirts and apparel. We never got caught in what was popular. Um, and then people paid for those shirts. And so it's this really great cycle of um, us really not having to do any of the hard work, which we'll talk about in a second. But we had about 100,000, so I left in 2009, so these stats are all a little old. But by that time, we had hundreds of thousands of designs uploaded. Uh, we had millions of votes on these designs. Uh, millions of t-shirts were sold. And because I'm not really supposed to talk about revenue, this is our revenue numbers. Um, I figured that's good. But the best part, as I mentioned, is we did none of the hard work. All we did was was really just take money and drive go-karts. It was really great. Um, the hard work was done by the crowd, and I think that's what the crowdsourcing was. And we didn't really know that we invented crowdsourcing. All we knew is we wanted to make these great t-shirts. Um, so the technology stack was very simple, and I keep in mind this was mid-2000s, PHP, APC, MySQL. Um, we used physical servers. We were a big Rackspace customer. We loved it. Um, but the reason we did all this stuff is because it was very easy and understood. It didn't get in the way of the most important thing, was really to be able to focus on the product. We didn't want to pick technology that made it hard. Um, and so around 2009, I accomplished all my goals, so I did the one thing that makes sense. I quit. I just left. And uh, at that point, I went on a vision quest. Does everyone here know what a vision quest is? Okay, so I've been... Um, 
doing a lot of speaking recently in Europe and Asia, no one knows what a vision quest there is. And so I always describe it as it's when you go to the desert and do a lot of drugs. But I didn't do that. Um, what I did actually is I, I, I joined a VC firm in Chicago and just helped them out with some due diligence and some advisory work, which, I, which is probably very similar to the peyote. Um, but um, the reason I did that is because I was really trying to figure out what makes an organization grow? What makes an organization sustain? How do you build an organization that lasts? And I thought there's, there's no better place to, to find this out than, than people who are, have a profession of making organizations go. Um, so I spent a lot of time helping people, um, you know, startups, etc. And for about two years, I was just wandering the earth trying to figure out where next. And then out of nowhere, um, this opportunity came, out, came up. Um, I met this guy, Michael Slavey, through a friend who was actually a Republican. He was like, you should meet Michael Slavey. Michael Slavey's a really great guy. He's uh, um, was CTO of 2008. Um, Michael Slavey is, uh, he was, he was uh, basically my boss in 2012. But I'm trying to think the best way to describe him. Um, well, there's two things. One, he's incredibly, incredibly smart. And two, he dresses like this on a Saturday. <laughs> so, um, that's the type of guy he is. Whereas, this is me. <laughs> so I mean, this, this is my favorite transition, right there, right? But I was obviously the CTO in, in 2012, and so um, there's a lot of questions about this, like, what, you know, what, why? This is my favorite slide, by the way. The reason is, does everyone know YOLO? Okay, the reason I love this slide is because everyone that knows YOLO face palms. They're like, why is that up there? It's up there because it's funny. Um, so, why Harper? That's the real question here. Why, why, did they, why did they go out of their way to find someone like me? Um, and to get into this, you have to think about what is the difference between 2008 and 2012? Well, first of all, in 2008, um, let's just think about it from social media because it's an, easy, it's an easy illustration. In 2008, the iPhone was about a year old. Apps were really new. Um, Facebook pages were created specifically for um, Barack Obama's profile because Barack Obama's profile had too many friends and too many users. Um, what else? Uh, Android had just been released, I think its first commercial uh, um, in November of 2008, its first commercial handset. Um, Twitter was used by, by pretty much hippies, right? Like myself and a few others. We used Twitter, we loved it. But, but everyone else was like, what's the deal with this Twitter? This doesn't make sense. The campaign used Twitter because they thought it was cute, quaint. Um, 2012, my mom is using all of that technology. <laughs> and that's literally the difference. Um, if you look at the difference in technology, the difference in, in data, suddenly all of that world that we had in 2008, when big data was big because it was hard to store, when all of these things were happening, all that changed in 2012, where this was now the status quo. We had to do this stuff. So I was describing this and kind of describing the needs of this to um, my wife, who happens to be Japanese, and she said, well, there's this Japanese proverb, um, Mochi wa mochi ya, which basically means if you want rice cakes, you need to go to the rice cake dealer. The idea being that if you're going to buy mochi at the grocery store, it's going to be really crappy mochi. You've got to go to the, the mochi store. Um, and it's this really interesting idea. If you want engineers to do this engineering that we know we need, you have to go to the engineers. You cannot find the engineers in politics. You cannot find engineers in marketing. You cannot, and this, this is something I think we see this a lot, right? It used to be that we used to have E in front of all of our businesses, right? It used to be e-marketing, e-business, e-politics, and now what is it? It's just business, marketing, and politics. Because we've finally gotten to this world where we're bringing in the engineers into our businesses instead of converting the various people in our businesses to try and understand technology. And that's really what the campaign did. That was the big difference. In 2008, they said, everyone here just wrapped your head around technology. In 2012, they said, we need to bring the technology in-house. So, um, you guys like GitHub? GitHub's great, right? Um, we used a lot of GitHub. It was, it was a huge part of our um, workflow. Um, but what do you do with that? So you say, okay, we have technologists. They hire me. I hire a few people. But the core was, I need to hire a bunch of engineers. Um, and so I hired about 40 engineers. These are back-end engineers. These are the people who are building the foundations for the campaign. Um, I hired from all these great companies. You've probably heard of a few. There's one really important one. Um, I had about 120 tech staff. Um, now this is an important number because the reason this is important is it's about 10 times the number of tech staff we had in 2008. Um, and so 
We just basically said, we gotta blow it up. We need to do 10 times the tech we did in 2008, and we did a lot in 2008. In 2008, if you remember, it was known as a tech campaign. We need to do 10 times that. Um, a couple of characteristics of campaigns that make it really interesting. First of all, start, you start from zero. Um, I came in in April 2011, and I, I was like, well, where's the source code? And they were like, um, what source code? And I was like, well, you know, all the source code. You had all these great apps. And they're like, oh, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, they didn't say, but I'm pretty sure they burnt it in a victory dance somewhere. Like, <laughs> they just had it in a pile, and they just lit it on fire and danced around it. Um, because there was no source code. And this is fascinating to me, because I'm, you know, I'm an engineer. This is something like, imagine going into an organization that is a big enterprise, and they have no source code that's gone. Um, and we also had 18 months. And so we had about, you know, that's a long time. Um, and when I started, I was like, that's forever. When I ended, I was like, that's about a week. Um, and so 18 months seems like a lot. And um, we had to focus on just one thing and one thing only, which was execution. Um, so this, <clears throat> this is actually a cake that, uh, obviously it's a cake, right? This is a cake. That's done, next slide, no. Um, this is a cake that one of my engineers made right before uh, election day, like a week or two before election day. He brings it in and, um, we're all like, we can't eat this. Like, what happens if we fuck it up? Like, then it's really, I mean, and it, only in elections do all these very rational engineers suddenly get super, superstitious. But um, we won the election, and obviously then they were like, oh, the okay. cake, and they went and ate it, which I thought was riskier than before. Um, but uh, the reason this is up here is this is the first, this, this phrase is the first thing that Jim Messina told me, and Jim Messina was a campaign manager. He basically said, Harper, I'm glad to have you, don't fuck it up. Um, and that's basically the, the idea. There's only, uh, technology did not win the election for the president, but technology easily could have lost it. And so the only thing we had to do was be successful here. So to be successful, what did we do? Um, well, we focused on one thing, and that was to build a, a platform, and uh, it was called Narwhal. Did anyone hear about Narwhal? Um, <coughs> so Narwhal, um, I actually have some illustrations here. Um, this is Jim Messina. Uh, Photoshop as a narwhal. Um, we had a lot of fun with this because um, there's a lot of trust deficit um, with between tech because we we're outsiders and we were coming in and they brought us in to do this job. And the inside, like the people who had been in politics and campaigns, were just like, "Who are these clowns?" And um, they called us Occupy Campaign. Um, and you know, and so this, it's like we needed to figure out how to defeat this trust deficit. So we used a lot of humor. Um, it was a lot of fun, and these are actually real. Um, illustrations, let's call them, that um, we used to during real presentations, and Jim Messina loved them. He actually, I thought this one was the best. This one was obviously the creepiest. We thought this was hilarious, but he liked this one the best. So, um, anyway, sorry. So Narwhal was a concept, and the thing about Narwhal was really it was just an API, and it just allowed us to have this foundation. And so, like any platform, it allowed us the freedom to do the thing that was the most important once again, which is focus on the products. And this is a huge thing for. Um, you know, any organization that can't, we can't be innovative, we just have to execute. Um, and so we had a, this, we had a bunch of products, but here, here's some of the big ones. So Call Tool, um, Call Tool, um, did anyone here use Call Tool? You can raise your hand slowly and secretly if you don't want to share. Okay, so Call Tool, um, basically what it allowed you to do is you logged in, you saw a number, and you saw a script, you could call that person, um, and then read the script, and then enter data in, and that would allow us to understand who that person was, and it allows you to volunteer, and it's a really cool tool, and we had two or three of them, worked out really well. Millions and millions of people were called. Um, Dashboard, um, Dashboard was an online version of our offline field office. Um, this is a really exciting application that allowed a lot of people all over the country um, to participate in, a, um, in something that is actually, um, some people, is kind of hard to participate in. So, for instance, if you are a rural user and you, can't, you don't have a field office near you, you can just log in instead of driving into a city. Um, this worked out pretty well as well. Mobile apps, we had a lot of mobile apps. We had an iPhone and Android app. Um, but the more important thing is we invested heavily in responsive design. So all of our apps, internal apps, internet apps, external apps, etc., were responsive, which meant that they would be able to be used on any um, device, <coughs> tablet, um, iPhone, Android phone, etc., and of course, regular computers. Um, our contribution apps are pretty awesome. Um, Teddy Goff, who is the head of digital and the head of fundraising online, I think he said we raised about 690 million online. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, some of the software we built, I think, raised about 350 million um, through it. 
I think that same software cost, if I'm not mistaken, about $800 a month to host. Mm -hmm. um, so the ROI on that was pretty good. Um, on social, uh, social I think is largely boring, so I'm going to skip it. Um, big data. Who here likes big data? Okay. Good, everyone shakes hands. So the, one of our big innovations was big data, right? But I have a little bit of an intervention here. I'm going to call this, this is my intermission, my intervention intermission. So big data. Who, who actually says the words big data here? Let's see your hands. Okay, good. So I actually think that big data is bullshit. <laughs> and here's why. This is the real reason. It's very simple. The thing is, big data is like from 2007. I remember sitting in a room in 2007, 2008 being like, man, I have all this data. It's such a pain in the ass to, to store. What are we going to do? And then everyone's like, well, Google has this crazy thing, and Yahoo's thinking about this other stuff, and all of a sudden, how do you, bam. And then all of a sudden, it's easy to store. Disks are cheaper, etc. Suddenly, there's cloud, all this fun stuff. And so now, big data's done. It's solved. When we say big data, I know you guys are all in like the marketing industry here for big data, so bear with me. Um, when we say big data, that it, we're buying into marketers. We're buying into the marketing terms of fear and FUD around you're not going to have enough space to store your data. <laughs> OMG. Well, that's not true. Like, does anyone here actually have really big data? Because the campaign's data, there's one person in the back that was like, yeah, I do. I'm scared for that person. Um, because the campaign, we had big data, and we could have stored it on a desktop computer that you could buy from Best Buy, because disks are cheap. Now, I would not do that, right? That's crazy. But the thing that we need to focus on here is questions. And what I want to hear, and I want a conference around this, and I think you guys are the type that can help me here. I want a, question, I want a conference about questions and answers, and specifically big answers. Because if there's something that we're not talking about right now, it's how do you find the, and how do you do the analysis of that data? I think in 2008, when we were talking about how to store data, that was hard. Right now, what's hard is finding the, the, the insights from that data. So that's my, that's my question for you. Okay. So obviously, what? So obviously, the innovation here was not the big data, but it was the, the data. And uh, this was something that I love. I love the data. Um, the media also loves the data. Um, so here's a little Google query. Um, Obama campaign data. This is actually, this is pretty boring. Um, let's actually tweak it a little bit. Obama campaign micro-targeting. So let's look at that first. Look at that. What does that even mean? I have no idea what that even means. <laughs> this is also my favorite, this is my favorite picture from the internet. Um, has anyone seen this picture before? This is literally one of the best pictures of the internet. And, uh, I think this happened a couple times and like we just showed this picture and people were like, is that a real horse? <laughs> Use your best judgment. I don't know. Maybe. Um, so micro-targeting, obviously, based on the horse, you can tell that micro-targeting is really exciting. People are excited about micro-targeting. I think a lot of it is because it's just misunderstood. Um, but we used a lot of it. We used a lot of it with email. Did anyone here get an email from us? Okay, good. Um, this is a tweet. Does anyone know Dan Sinker? Dan Sinker is a, a, a journalist guy who works for Night Mozilla. Um, Dan Sinker tweeted this in 2008. Um, the reason that this is up here is because I want to demonstrate that nothing has changed in regards to the amount of email that we have sent. But what did change is a technology we use to personalize this email. So here's an email that I received, um, I think probably in October. Um, and uh, the interesting thing here is this. <coughs> the 56 bucks. So it says, <laughs> Why don't you donate $56? That's a weird number. And you know, my little computer science head is like, it's out of order. And, and you know, it's what, obviously, this is the number that I was like, yeah, sure. Like, um, and I, of course, donated $56. Um, but what we did is we went, looked at all of my previous contributions, and we found what is, what is the amount that Harper is most likely to contribute. Um, the other important thing about this is these links, when you click them, immediately take the money from my credit card. There's no confirmation. <laughs> now you all laugh because you've been on the internet too long. But we raised probably $150 million with no confirmation. And the key here is, this is exactly what commerce is going to. So, why ask for confirmation? It just decreases conversion. Um, so the other thing we did is we said, okay, email is cool, but what if we combine this with social? And this is where I think social can be interesting. It's not when you are like, here, find your Facebook friends, but when you just connect with social. So this was a very simple um, Facebook connect. We threw this on our, our logins, 
and so everyone connected with, with social. Then we were able to send emails like this. Once again, this is an actual email that I received. Um, October again, um, and uh, here's the personalization points. Um, so John Ruth is actually one of my best friends. Um, using the data, they went ahead, and um, so you guys all have those friends on Facebook. Is everyone here on Facebook, for the most part? Okay. You have those friends that, that like things, and you're just like, who are these people? You know what I'm talking about? Then you have the friends that comment on stuff, and you're just like, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> and then you have the friends that are those people that are also in your photos, right? And so we, we took a lot of this data, we looked through, and we figured out a simple model to be like, these are the people that you influence. People that like your stuff, people that comment on your stuff, but are also in your photos is a good example of those people. Um, and so we would say things like, Harper, um, you should call John and reach out to John and just make sure that, that he is voted. Make sure that he can vote. Um, and we surfaced that data that we got from Facebook, that we got from social, in a non-Facebook or social way. This is a one-to-one -one email. This is not a, you know, find your friends or any of this kind of social stuff we think of. This is one-to-one -one marketing using social data that we gleaned. Um, and this was incredibly successful. So we also did this with SMS. Um, we took SMSs and we would send them out. Um, using our quick donate technology, we were able then to execute on the donation. And this is, it worked great. I, I swore that it was going to be like this though. I swore it was just going to, because I figured SMS was just so easy to, you know, I mean, you know how it is, right? SMS seems like something that would be easy to screw up. And I was really scared of that. But it worked so well that we even use it on um, holidays. Um, and so this is, this is an example, and then I'm pretty sure it actually was like that. Um, it's New Year's, right? And New Year's is not the time. Um, but, the thing is, and this worked incredibly well, micro-targeting, using the data, being very aware, just, it helped us raise so much money, um, it really helped us do better content distribution. Um, in regards to contacting voters, it made everything more efficient. This was great. Um, and it was incredibly, it worked very well. But the one thing that, that, that we didn't do very well over the beginning, or we weren't, we weren't starting to do, is listening. So, does anyone know who this guy is? It's Tim O'Reilly. Apparently this is a bad picture, because I'm always like, does anyone know who this guy is? And everyone does it, and then I go like this, and everyone says, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, Tim O'Reilly, I was hanging out with him, he was like, Harper, I'm tired of micro-targeting, I want you to focus on micro-listening. And it was one of those, um, okay, but then as, as you dig into it, it's like, how do you use the same technology that you use in targeting to have a conversation, to push that conversation closer to the user? When I talk to marketers, a lot of times you hear this, this echo back. They're not talking about listening, they're not talking about a conversation, but they're talking about how do you do one-to-one -one marketing? How do, you, how do you make sure you're closer to the consumer? Um, I think if you just said, how do you have a conversation, I think the consumer would be more interested in that. So we, we jumped into this pretty hard. Um, we did this a few ways. <coughs> so we did voter contact. <coughs> you have a guy, excuse me for a second. <coughs> I don't think that did it. You might just say, fuck it. <laughs> <clears throat> so you imagine you have this guy, and he's knocking on the doors, and uh, he knocks on the door, and uh, he gets a little bit of data, so he knocks on the door, and someone says, he says, are you supporting the president? And he says, yes. And he says, well, you know, is there anything I'd like, you'd like to tell us? He's like, well, I'm a veteran. And so we write that information down, and it's really great. And then, you know, the next thing, and that, that actually happens, and that has always happened. But the thing that really is exciting about that is then taking that data, putting it in our database that has all this data about a lot of people, all of our volunteers, all people we knocked on those doors, Looking at that and then saying, okay, what really helps is when veterans contact veterans. Because we know that based on our modeling. And so then the next step is having a veteran contact that person. And so you constantly have this loop of you grab data, you execute on the data, you grab more data, you execute on that data. And a constant loop. We did this with knocking on doors, we did this with, with phones. It worked incredibly well um, because we were able to have a conversation and we were able to use that conversation to generate more data to have better conversations. And this really, I think this really helped. Um, <clears throat> we did this a lot on Twitter. This is actually one of my favorite slides because it's, uh, it's kind of funny. So on Twitter we did this thing where we sent, we once again looked at who, are, who is influential on Twitter. And I hate saying that because that's like buying right into the social media consultants world. Who is influential? Not influential like they're influential Twitter users. We just found the people who followed us who had a small group of people that they were influential with. We sent them a DM and we said, hey, why don't you tell your friends to vote? Why don't you tell your friends to go to this event? And we sent those DMs from Barack Obama, um, uh, Michelle Obama, and the Vice President. So these are some real uh, tweets that came out of this. Um, people were really surprised. My favorite one is the uh, Felix special because they got a DM from Joe Biden. He's kind of like America's drunken uncle. Um, 
<laughs> I think that's really funny. But um, you know, the only person that's that's verified on here is Snoop Dogg. I don't know. I'm surprised he got one. But uh, the, the idea here is how do you get your people by getting close to them, by sending them a message that they think is very personal, how do you get them to, to interact? Um, the other thing we did, which is something that I think everyone who has web apps at all can do, is ask. Um, we asked some simple questions. This is a screenshot from Dashboard. Um, we just said, hey, how, how much work did you do today? And people would enter the amount of work that they did today. Um, we were able to compare that, from the, or compare that to the amount of work they actually did. And we we're also able to say, hey, how do you feel today? So we're able to get all sorts of information about A, if they're good workers or if they're self-reporting well, and B, how they're feeling. We got a lot of feedback through this, and we we're able to really make our apps better by listening through this kind of portal. Um, so listening really worked, and it was a really awesome opportunity to get closer to our users. Let's talk about technology a little bit. <clears throat> so we used a lot of pretty standard tech, Python, Ruby, PHP, all the stuff you'd expect. Um, same with our data stores, we, we, we standardized on MySQL, we also added a lot of other things. Um, we use StatsD and Graphite, does everyone here know StatsD and Graphite? It's probably the best thing in the world, you should check it out if you don't know it. Um, Pop and Vagrant for deploys, um, and then we used Ubuntu because we're adults. <laughs> um, the OFI framework is the framework that I like to call um, Use All the Things. Um, we basically just said, we're going to use everything that allows us to be successful. And the reason was, we just couldn't, we just couldn't wait for, we just couldn't wait for what was, I, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. We didn't want to have to be religious about a technology and, not, and be slow to build some product. We wanted to just use what was going to be the best thing for that product. Regardless of the infrastructure, obviously we used a lot of cloud. Um, we had about 200 products. This is basically our architecture map. Um, I'm just kidding. We had, we had thousands and thousands of servers. I don't know if anyone has seen this. Um, this, is, uh, this was built by one of our volunteers, um, who happened to be a, a pretty good AWS. Um, so we used AWS. We used a lot of it. Um, we had thousands and thousands of servers. My favorite part is uh, we were all on East, so the West stuff was just a backup. Um, but my favorite part is here. Let's see if I can... Right here, the staging and testing are complete replicas of this entire thing that's scrolling by. Um, and so we were able to do this for pretty cheap. Um, it, was, it was very easy to do. We had four ops people, um, and that was it. We had no more than that. Um, it was great. It worked out really well for us. Um, there was no way that we could have been successful without this. Um, here's some stats for you. This is Scott Vandenplatz, our head of DevOps. It was awesome. We required the cloud. There's just absolutely no way we could have done that without it. So the reason we chose this tech, as I mentioned, is because we wanted to focus on what simply solved the problems. Um, because failure was aggressively not an option. There was no way that we could fail. Um, so we invested in a couple things. The first thing we did is user experience. Um, you, you guys work with user experience people. Are there any user experience people here? They somehow wandered wander to the wrong conference. <laughs> so the thing about user experience people is we often treat them bad. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but we shouldn't because they're nice and they're, they're really important. Um, and we did a lot of testing, aggressive, aggressive testing. We practiced failure a lot. Um, we did this for about a month. But the thing that's interesting about the campaign is the campaign focuses on practicing failure constantly. This is an important part of the campaign. We even had a mock election day a couple times with thousands and thousands of volunteers. Um, from the very beginning, the idea of making sure you understood how things could fail um, is, is huge. It's a big cultural part of the campaign. It's really important. I'll talk about it in a little bit. But election day, you know, for the most part, because there could be no more changes, because we didn't want to screw it up, um, it was pretty chill out. You know, we, you know, everything worked out pretty well. And uh, um, yeah, but we won, which is good. And uh, that's when you guys applaud. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. So before I jump into the meat of the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about politics. I really need to change this slide because this is politics with a capital P, and this should be politics with a little p. Um, how many here have an organization of which they have some little tiny politics, little p politics? OK, so everyone's hand should be up because it's life, <laughs> right? Um, so does anyone know who this is? This is John Maeda. John Maeda is the president of RISD, and um, 
he came into my office one day and he just kind of ran into my office. I'm like literally jogging. And he runs in and he's just basically like, Harper, um, I bet you deal with a lot of little people politics because you know you're an insurgent organization, you're outsiders, um, you don't really know politics, you know, campaigns. Um, and so I'm sure that you deal with a lot of people who don't trust you, big trust deficits, et cetera. And he said, but the key here is um, how to solve this. It's very simple. You need to manage by your app box. You need to make sure that you're the one that's reaching out to those people, that you're not waiting for them to reach out to you, especially for contentious relationships. Um, and so he says this to me, and then he runs out jogging again out of the office. Um, and a couple weeks go by, and I'm just kind of like, this is kind of in my head. And so I finally decide, okay, I'm going to try it. And so this is one relationship that is particularly contentious. I send an email, and I'm just like, hey. Um, and I look through my emails, and I notice that I don't have a lot of emails to this person. I have a lot from. So I'm like, I need to up my, my inbox ratio here. I need to make sure I'm sending more emails out than if they're coming in. So I send an email, I start sending an email basically every day. It's just like, hey, this is the status on the product. This is where we're at, how do you feel? And the email response, the first couple were like, hey, thank you for emailing. Um, and that showed that there was a problem. Like, he's thanking me for emailing. He's not thanking me for the progress. He's, not, he's thanking me for taking the effort to email. It shows that I'm not doing my job. I mean, so this was a really interesting and telling situation, but it obviously, or not obviously, but it really opened up and solved some of the politics with little people problems. So if you have those problems at your workplace, please um, follow this, and I guarantee it'll, it'll help out a little bit. So the three lessons that we, that we learned, or you know, the three things I want to talk about are building a great team, practicing failure, and then facilitating community. Um, building a great team is my favorite one, so let's talk about that first. So the innovation on the campaign, whether it was tech, field, the executive team, digital, etc., finance, it doesn't matter, it was the team. That was the innovation. The innovation was not tech. The innovation was not anything exciting. It was just the people. Um, I'm sure this is in many of your organizations as well, where the tech can be replicated, but the people cannot. Um, and building a team, as you guys know, is not easy, right? Who, who here likes building teams? It's the best thing in the world. Um, these are some of the ways that we do it. So the first thing that we do is we, we talk about how important it is to prune. And you hear this a lot, right? But you can't be afraid to fire people. This is the number one thing. Um, it's also very hard. But the thing about firing people is this doesn't mean that your life with them is over. It just means that right now they didn't work out. There's been a couple times where we have let someone go at organization A and hired them at organization B. Because you understand what they, how they work, what they're doing, that doesn't mean that, that it's over forever with them. So don't look at this as an end of life thing, just look at this as it's not working out right now. Um, everyone know this movie? Yeah, good movie. I have never seen it. Should I see this movie? Okay, good. So ABC, obviously, ABC is really important. Um, always be closing. Um, I like to think of this a little bit differently though. Um, obviously, when you're trying to hire someone, you're trying to hire a team, you've got to close constantly. But I actually think a lot of people are boring with their closing. They're always like, we need an engineer, a rails engineer, blah, 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 blah. It's so boring. Why don't you say, we're trying to save the world? That should be the first sentence of every job description. And then from there, you should tell why and how. We need to be more creative with this stuff. This stuff will help you get better people, will help you grow your team. It's actually probably easy because I work for the president, so we actually were trying to save the world. Maybe. Um, A's hire A's, B's hire C's. You guys have heard this before, yes? Who here is an A? I kind of love asking that. <laughs> you guys are way too slow. Everyone should be like, yep, right here, A. Good, that guy got it. Um, but this is very simple. It's basically just hire the people who are smarter than you. Always hire smarter than you. Um, always hire up. It's important. I like to do this because I'm really lazy and I don't want to do any work. So I, I hire people who are better at me and doing it, then I don't have to do it anymore. This is great. Um, trust. Trust is obviously incredibly important for your team. I don't really know a good way to quantify this, so I'll just, I'll just say if you guys have any good stories about trust, why it's important, or why, or situations where it hasn't been, please tell me after or tweet at me. I'd love to hear them. Um, measuring everything, here's actually some uh, stats D graphs, graphite graphs, good stuff. But we measured everything, everything. And the reason was because we wanted to be able to quantify and celebrate, more importantly, success. We want to talk about success, we want to be able to give credit. And this was really huge. So every Friday we'd get together and we'd talk about what successful things we had. We used the metrics to show they were successful. And then we'd do demos and say, awesome job, this is great. And really give credit to the person who was successful. Um, diversity, I think, is one of the most important things that you can add to your team. Don't be afraid to hire people that look different than you. This is incredibly important. 
Um, it's not so hard for me, right? No, I'm just kidding. But um, this is really important. And the reason is because, uh, I mean, for the most part, I mean, obviously you guys do a lot of things with data centers and whatnot, but for the most part, our products are being used. The internet is a pretty global situation. We need to build, build teams that represent the audience. This is really important. Um, it's also pretty hard. Um, I had a really hard time with it on the campaign. We tried really hard and we ended up hiring just a bunch of white dudes with beards. Um, this was kind of disappointing. And so I think, you know, the thing that we have to do is, there's two things that I try and do. The first one is we have to try. So that's the number one thing. You have to try. The number two thing here is you need to talk about it, whether you're successful or whether you fail at it. Because unless we're talking about it, we're never going to be able to trade those, those ways to be successful or those ways that we've failed. Um, and then we will never be able to iterate because iterating is what technology is all about. We can iterate on this product, which is diversity in teams. Um, Etsy has done a really good job of this. Um, they've talked a lot about some of their challenges. They've talked a lot about how they've, they've solved some of these problems, how they've, they've been able to overcome this in some ways. I definitely suggest searching that out. Um, but it's not going to be easier if we continue to ignore it. And I do hear a lot of organizations ignoring it. Um, and so I think this is something that's really important. Um, there is one more thing that I think is, is, is actually more important than diversity, which is surprising. Um, and I think that's shipping. Your team will not be successful. It doesn't matter if you have the most diverse team, the best team in the world, if you don't ship. So if you have a product that's just waiting to be pushed out, push it out. Suddenly your users are not the theoretical users. They're actual real users. And then you can really start to, to, to run. And that's when it's most exciting. Building a team is hard, but it's so much, it's so important. It's worth that difficulty. So let's move on to practicing failure. Now, practicing failure is something that, you know, the campaign did a lot. The reason is because failing is hard. It sucks, right? But um, understanding failure is basically understanding success. If you can really understand how you're going to fail, you can really understand what success means. Um, how we did this, we did this a bunch of ways. So the first thing is user experience. And user experience is really important because it allows you to talk to the users. There's so many organizations I know that are building great products and they never talk to the users, which doesn't make any sense. Where they talk to them merely as customers. They don't talk to them as users. And I've been guilty of this, many have before, but the user experience allows you to understand the difference between functional and usable. We can all build functional products. I'm sure there's many functional products in this room. But the question is, how many of them are aggressively usable? And it doesn't matter what your tech is. Our internal products were, we, we had user experience people look on, which often doesn't happen. You often don't think, oh, well, we need some UX people to look at our internet. That's why all the internets suck in the world, right? Um, but this is really important. A-B testing is also something that's important. What do you, which one's better? Um, have you guys seen this movie? OK, this is a great movie, right? It is only about multivariate testing. It's entire, the entire movie is literally Bill Murray trying to multivariate test his way out of Groundhog Day. And there's a great blog post online about how long he has been in the movie. It's like 500 years. Um, but the thing is, is, testing really allowed us, whether it was A-B testing, multivariate testing, web, email, edit, whatever, it allowed us to understand where we were wrong. We were constantly, constantly wrong. We had no idea how, like for instance, uh, our email team has this, has this great story about how they um, they, had a, they had like a little pool going um, where they would bet on which subject line would be successful. And I don't think anyone ever won the money. Because the email team, which is probably one of the best email teams in the world, who was in charge of all of the email that raised all of our money, they, could ne they never knew what the users were going to convert on. Um, without testing, we would have just been blind. So, so um, when, you, when you look at your email campaigns and you look at that and you're not doing testing, Keep thinking about that, about how the best email team in the world could not get it right by, based on their gut. Fail safety is something that I find really important, especially when you're building products for people. Um, I had this opportunity to go see the space shuttle launch, the last one. Um, has anyone seen the space shuttle launch? So isn't it awesome? It's like the coolest thing you'll ever see, or you ever would have seen. Sorry, guys. Um, but the thing about the space shuttle is, <laughs> they practice this idea of fail safety. This is the biggest wall of text I have. Um, the important part is here. Um, you'll cause no harm or, harm or at least minimal harm to other devices or danger to personnel. We do not practice user fail safety. We often provide situations for our users to, to get in a cul-de-sac of harm. 
also known as like a 500 error or a 404 page. All of these places where it's just suddenly a wall and the user has nowhere to go. They don't know what to do. You, you know, go back home. Well, that's not helpful. You know where they're trying to go or where they were going to go. How do, you, how do you create a situation where that user can be redirected into a place that is happy or that a place not happy, but is successful? We did this a lot where in any of our apps, if any of them died, we said, well, the user who's trying to go to this app is trying to get work done. So let's put them to another place where they can get work done. Let's not show an error page. If you go to the call tool and the call tool fails, we said, well, sorry, the call tool is not working. Why don't you go over here and do more work? Um, this was very simple. The idea was we would never show an error that just said error. All it would say is, this didn't quite work the way we thought it was going to do. Why don't you step over here and do more work? Um, we've tried to practice fail safety. We never wanted to show failures. We never wanted to harm the users. Um, and that's, this, is, this is it. That's it. I think it's a really important thing to think about. Um, but the most important thing here is practice. <clears throat> so we did these things called game day. And anyone here going to Velocity? Um, Okay, uh, Thursday morning, my, my buddy Dylan, who was our director of engineering, is speaking specifically about game days. Um, he also has a book on Amazon that's free, you should check it out. Um, game days are really important. This was in the idea of getting all of our infrastructure together. Um, and because we used uh, cloud, we just made a whole new uh, copy of it. Um, real data, real users, um, everything was real. We then went through and we just destroyed it. So we absolutely just destroyed pieces of it. Um, Dylan and one of his buddies, one of our DevOps guys, um, basically played it like a D&D &D game. And so, you know, the DevOps guy would be in, in our chat room and it'd be like, a wild DBA appears and has taken down all the databases. You know, and then the engineers have to react. They have to figure out what happens when the databases go down. Um, and this was great because this allowed us <clears throat> to understand exactly what happens when our queues disappear. What happens? Suddenly we can, we can quantify that. We can write it down. What happens when, our, when this database suddenly becomes read-only? What happens when you can't read from it, but when you, when you can write from it? What happens when there is no database? What happens when DNS goes down? We can answer all of those questions. We can make sure that every single one of our apps were able to run without a database. Especially when you're trying to build elastic, resilient apps, this is really important. Um, I don't think that you can really believe in cloud computing, especially on Amazon, if you are not thinking about how do your apps succeed in these bad situations, in these bad environments. Um, so we did this aggressively. We took down everything. And the thing that we created out of this was basically a runbook. So on election day, if we had catastrophic failure, you'd say, oh, what happened? Oh, this happened. Oh, that's page 32. You turn to page 32, you type in those commands, and it would, it would go away. Um, this, was, this was amazing. Um, our game days helped us quantify our limits. This was a huge opportunity. Um, we didn't have any downtime. Um, we did have catastrophic failure. But we were able to mitigate it immediately and not actually show it to the users. Um, and so we didn't fail. This was huge. Um, facilitating community. This is something that's obviously really important. Um, I think it's the number one thing. I think it's the power behind your brand, behind your company, but it's also the power behind your success. Um, we often underestimate the communities that surround our brands. So how do you facilitate it? Um, at Threadless, we did this a lot of ways. Um, and this, this, these thoughts started at Threadless, and then obviously the campaign really solidified a lot of it. But the first thing is authenticity. Um, so this is a guy named Charlie. Um, Charlie was probably our most authentic uh, user. He was kind of like a, the platonic form of a th threadless user. Um, a like middle class white guy um, wearing t-shirts somewhere in America. Um, this is pretty much it. There was a certain time though that, that Charlie um, kind of stopped wearing threadless shirts. We were just like, what happened Charlie? But we didn't actually say that. We just said, ah, oh, look at Charlie's over there, he's crazy. We knew he was the authentic threadless user, but we, when he, when that carry in the coal, canary in the coal mine moment happened, we didn't listen. And so because we weren't practicing, we weren't engaging and making sure that we were understanding the authentic user, we really lost this opportunity because that was a good early warning for when the brand kind of took a turn. We could have, of course, corrected. And so really understand what authenticity means for your brand. Understand who those authentic users are and really engage them and understand them because the moment that they turn, you can, you can, you can get behind them and you can say, hey, why did you leave? Why did you turn? This is really important. Um, purpose is another thing that I really saw purely in the campaign. Um, there's nothing like hearing an announcement like when uh, you know, a bill is signed or when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was kind of overturned, any of these things, and then seeing users, um, seeing coworkers with tears in their eyes, hugging, understanding that, yes, this is why we are there. 
Um, how do you engage that purpose? How do you push that purpose out to your users so they really understand why you are there? Obviously with the president, it's a pretty big deal. It's easy to do that. But how do you do that with your brand and your company? Empowering the users is really important. Um, and throughout this, we have this thing where we have a lot of people upload crappy designs. It happens all the time. Um, so what we try to do is we try to say, how do we use the users who are good at designs to help the users who are bad at designs? How do we get them to work together? Um, how do we empower them to, to interact, to make all of the designs better. So we created this tool called Critique. And what it did, and I actually don't think it's on there right now, but what it did is it allowed users to collaborate together to make better designs. Um, you see this all over the internet. It's just about how do you make the work, how do you take the work that you guys are doing internally and give it to the users externally. My favorite version was this, uh, this company called uh, Cloudkick. Um, at the bottom of every page, they have this very simple thing that you'll see at the bottom left here, which says, I wish this page would, and then they had a free text field. Really just asking your users, hey, what do you want? Let us know, we will give it to you. Because that's all users want to hear, and you can ask them and you get crazy stuff back. But the most important thing is safety. So here's a question for you, I want hands. How many people know this guy? How many people are this guy? <laughs> There's always one person in the audience that's like, yeah, I me. Mean, you're just like, huh, interesting. <laughs> um, but, and then this is something that, uh, that obviously you guys may recognize. This is uh, the internet dig one theory. Um, a normal person <laughs> plus anonymity plus audience equals terrible person, right? Um, this is a pretty simple thing, and I think we all have seen this in action. Um, YouTube is a great place to check this out. Go to the comments. Wow. I don't even know. But um, this is all about trust. How do you create a place for trust? How do you have all these people, you know, they have audiences, they're gonna come into your communities, um, and they're just gonna say crazy stuff, they're gonna alienate people, how do you stop that? Well, I think there's a couple things to think about. The first thing is, um, this is not as hard for old users. For users who have been around a while, you see these old hands, they're on open source lists, and you know, some new person comes in, and they're just like, yeah, don't feed the trolls. But that's not, you know, that's not a native thing to think, that's something that you learn. And it's not fun to learn that. That just means we have a lot of scar tissue. Um, the hardest thing for the new user is trust. So how do we solve this new user thing? Well, we don't want to be this guy, right? That's obvious. This is like, this is, anyway. Um, <coughs> the important thing is we need to create a good neighborhood. I think this is much like neighborhoods. When you go into a neighborhood and you want to invoke trust, you want to invoke safety, you don't, you, you don't create a bunch of crappy places for them to live. You really need to make a very nice, Place. You need a place that looks like you care about the users in the community just as much as you want them to care about you. And you want to make it seem safe. So you want the tools that will give them safety. Um, because if you build that stuff, people will move there. But you have to create that environment, the environment that's worth trusting to get that trust in that space. So that's about it. Um, thanks for listening and remember you know, all of these important things. Um, Shipping is obviously the most important thing, so I want you guys to do that when you get home today. Ship your products, just all launch them. Just get them out there. <laughs> so we're good. Thank you. And then we just kind of wrapped it around that. We had a bunch of different teams that were broken out, and each of those teams kind of adopted a different level of uh, um, kind of strictness as they, as they needed. Um, and um, we used a lot of kind of information radiator type of walls and all that stuff, but um, there wasn't a like a, a dogma that we followed specifically. We just kind of it was whatever we would get done. Um, that was if it worked. It worked. I don't like Scrum. Yeah. Crowdsourcing, constituency management, virtual resource—a term developed 20 years earlier on Bowers Avenue. What do you think about how you compensate that virtual resource? What forms of compensation do those designers get other than? The feeling that they are participating in your environment. You pay them a royalty. Not there are pros and cons of corporate responsibility about utilizing their intellectual property, but not giving. What do you give them for their intellectual property? You're talking about threadless. Questions. Yeah. On threadless, we paid them about three or four grand each for each design. Really? Um, that is about thousand dollars, two thousand dollars more than you'd get if you worked for Patagonia making T-shirts. Mm -hmm. So um, we also licensed it and patent our, and copyrighted the designs in both names. So oftentimes crowdsourcing is seen as a place where you can develop spec work. Threadless is not one of those places. Thank you. Yeah. Do you 
could uh, advise the Obama administration on uh, uh, IT policies, what would be your recommendation? So one of the interesting things about this, this is a question that comes up a lot because of, I think John Stewart talks a lot about how um, there's a database problem and we need to get better IT policy inside of the White House. I actually don't think it's a problem of tech. I think it's a problem of bureaucracy between different departments. And so I think that you have a lot of very, very, very smart tech people inside. We don't need to get more tech people that are smart inside. We need to figure out how to, how to lube up the conversation between the different departments so they can talk easily and, and, and not be uh, competitive in sharing data, um, and which is not a tech problem. So I think that if, if I was to, you know, to advise the White House on IT, it would just be another wasted IT person. Um, what we need more is some, someone who can, who can advise the White House on working with other internal organizations. I don't think it's necessarily the White House. I think it's just these, these organizations that have been around forever, talking to organizations that have been around forever. They literally have different protocols, not people protocols, not data protocols. Um, it's, it's very hard to solve. I would also suggest that they open source everything. <laughs> yeah? Could you talk a little bit about the challenge of micro-targeting and, sorry, um, I'm wondering uh, what kind of struggles you had with people trusting you when it's a micro-targeting exercise and how you make the outbound communication feel authentic to them versus your <coughs> encroached on yeah. their privacy. This is a good question because uh, one of the big things that the campaign did and we're known for is design. And part of that is, you know, design when you think of ad stuff, especially ad world. Um, you know, the ad world is all about tone, it's all about design, it's all about, and so we made sure that every email we sent, regardless of how much personalization we had in it, was, well, was toned specifically for the campaign. So even though we had this great email team, they wrote all the emails, even if, it, if I was sending a recruiting email to a bunch of tech people, they wrote that email. So we always had to go through the same group to make sure the tone was the same. Um, the other thing was, is you know, we, we followed a lot of the learnings that a lot of big brands have, have, have learned. And, and our, our targeting was pretty, um, was, was pretty unsophisticated compared to like Target or any of these brands like that, you know, Amazon, etc. We weren't able to predict when people were pregnant or anything exciting like that, as you guys may remember from a few years ago. Great story. Um, but the, the thing that, that's important that you can learn, that we learned from those stories, is how important it is to make sure that your, your data doesn't show through in your creative. So to make sure that it's not creepy. And so we oftentimes tested this internally, we tested it with people, we did a lot of testing. And sometimes we stood on the edge of that. You know, I mean, <clears throat> receiving an email from, from the campaign that has your friend's name in it, that could be creepy. But just making sure that it, it doesn't seem creepy. Making sure that when you connect with Facebook, that we're you're clear about what we're going to do with the data, which we're very clear about. It. This will help us, you know, make sure that we notify you about when you about your friends and whatnot. You know, just being upfront about it, and transparent, I think, is one of the easiest ways to do that. But the biggest thing is to make sure that your data doesn't show up in your creative, because if your data shows up in your creative, that's like uh, you may know now that Target sends those same mailers, but they have now grills and all sorts of stuff on them because they're just like, we'll just act like we didn't know that you're. Yeah, thanks. In the back. Hey, so the campaign, of course, success is relative. Do you have any uh, comments on the failure of the other campsite before God and like yeah. that, things like that? Um, you know, there's there's a couple. The thing about the Orca, does everyone know, did everyone follow this in the news? It was fascinating. Um, so Orca was Romney's um, vote or poll watching app. Um, and we had a similar app named Gordon. Um, and um, Gordon, our app named Gordon, was named Gordon because in 2008 we had an app called Houdini, and Houdini failed. It went down about 9 o'clock on election day, 9.30 on election day in 2008. Um, that's the same app that went down for Romney in 2012. Exactly the same app. Um, so there's a couple things there that we could look at. First of all, Gordon is the person who killed Houdini, which is why we named our app in 2012, Gordon. We were like, no way, this is going down. Um, the second thing is, is we aggressively learned from our history. Um, we looked at 2008 and saw that go down, and so one of the biggest things that they said to me was, nothing can go down. We ha everything has to be up. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that the only reason, I would say one of the only reasons that I'm here on stage today is because Orca came out and they put a video out that said, Orca is going to destroy Narwhal. 
when it's apples and oranges. Nautilus was a concept of an API and platform. Orca was a simple app that just did poll watching and poll counting. Um, but because they said Orca is going to destroy Narwhal, and then when um, Orca crashed, a lot of people went to the press and said Orca crashed, suddenly the dialogue coming out of the campaign was that Narwhal destroyed Orca. And suddenly tech was the, tech was the, the dialogue. And I think if they would have had a little bit more press constriction and they wouldn't have been so hot, big on the hubris about Orca, I honestly think that people wouldn't have thought that tech was such a big deal. But because that dialogue came out of that, it just spun all of us from the tech team. We're all of a sudden in this light. We're just like, oh, hey, everyone. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty fun. Um, but uh, that, was, that was a big thing. Um, now, if you extrapolate this, and I've talked to a bunch of the people on the Romney side, I think the big difference between the Obama camp and the Romney camp in regards to tech, regards to data and tech, is um, every day there was a meeting, probably in both camps. I can't speak too much to the Romney side, but for the Obama side, um, with all of the senior people. And um, about halfway through the campaign, they invited myself, they invited Dan Wagner, they invited all of the people who were these kind of nerdy tech types into that leadership meeting. Um, and so we were there when they were talking about where the president was going. We were there when they were talking about every single part of the campaign. Um, and so what that says is we were in the boardroom. We were there helping make decisions. Um, on the Romney side, the engineers were in a separate building, they were in a separate place, they were relegated to where engineers were relegated in the past. I think you see this in the same way when you have these businesses. When you involve, when you bring tech into the boardroom so that the CEO and the tech leader can have that conversation about what is the, how realistic is this? Can we execute on this? Um, I think that's when, when you have to be, that's when you have success. And obviously the, the Republicans learned from this pretty, pretty, pretty aggressively because they just hired that guy from Facebook. Seems like a very good hire, um, and so you know we'll we'll see how that goes. I don't think that they're going to make that mistake again. Yeah, in the back. Talking about your expectation for the cloud community. Let's say you had to do it again, or you want to do it again in 2016. I assume your goal is to 10x. What's your expectation? By when? Um, a lot more servers. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think one of the things that that was really awesome is. Uh, because we use cloud computing, because we use all of our software was in the cloud, um, from a traffic perspective, we could have done anything. Like, it, it really didn't matter. <clears throat> um, it's going to be hard to hire 10 times 40 engineers. Um, that should be interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I hope it makes it more efficient. Um, but 2016 is going to be very interesting because we're both going to have about three months to do our technology instead of 16 months. So I do think that we're going to be using a lot more vendors, both sides. I think we're going to be using a lot more um, pre-built software. I don't think we're going to have time to experiment to figure out where we're going to go. Um, we probably will use just as much Amazon because it was so awesome. Um, sorry, OpenStack. I love you, but yeah. Um, so, yeah. How much of infrastructure are going to use? How much of infrastructure are we going to use for 2016? We're actually not going to use any of the infrastructure for 2016 because it's all turned off. Um, no we, source code. The source code. Well, the source code, we didn't do that dance. We didn't burn it because it's in GitHub this time. Um, but we are, uh, I'm trying to, to get as much of it open source as we can, but we're not quite there yet. So um, if it is not open sourced, um, it probably won't be used. But here's something to keep in mind. The, the source code, I mean, imagine your business. If you just open your, your, the business, your source code for your business, like no one else can really use it unless they're running your business. So no one can use our source code in its entirety unless they're trying to re-elect Barack Obama in 2011 to 2012. <laughs> if they're trying to do that, then go to it. It'll be great. I promise you, you you'll be successful. Um, so the problem is there's little pieces that are really interesting. There's a lot of pieces about how we automated our cloud environment. There's a lot of pieces about how we made sure that we pulled metrics from various apps. A lot of containers, a lot of little like classes and whatnot that would help anyone that is using Python or Ruby or you know any of this fun stuff. Um, that's the stuff that I really hope we're able to open source because I think it will help a lot of businesses. And it also isn't a competitive advantage shared with the other side. I think we have maybe one more question. Yeah. Just wondering how you integrated your outbounding uh, technology platform with the uh, historical kind of <coughs> demographic analysis that can't capture. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you bring those two together? Yeah, so um, 
That's actually a really, that's a good question. It's the first time I've ever been asked that. That's a really good question. Um, and it's actually, we didn't really integrate it. So we had our analytics team and they had their infrastructure and they kind of just ran with it. And it was on Vertica physical servers. Um, and then what we did is we just, when they needed more real-time data, we would help them get real-time data from our real-time data platform. When they, kind of just augmenting their current process. And um, this is something that's really important is technology should only augment. And so with the campaign, all technology did was augment the campaign. We just made it, a force multiplier made it a little quicker. Um, and that's really what we try to do with the analytics team. They had their own processes and they killed it. And so, you know, seeing them do how they do things, like, like we're not going to build a build process for them for R. Like, they have that down. Um, so what we can do is maybe give them better data, maybe give them quicker data, maybe allow them to query our big data, our user databases, things like that. Um, and so there was a, one of the things about the campaign was no silos. Um, and so we, we tried to make sure that everything was shared. Um, and that was really important. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, it was great to talk. And uh, don't forget to uh, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Bye.